All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Again, my name is Danny from the PhotoBiz team, and we're going to be joined by Andy from our passionate support team. And again, he's going to be talking about search engine optimization and how you can use SEO to your benefit. So a little bit about both of our background information. Um, I am part of the social media team here, so you guys probably are used to hearing me as the host of the webinar series. And if you attend different trade shows, you might have met me at a PPA or WPPI event. Or if you're at any local PPA events, we try and travel to those as well. And Andy has been part of our support team almost as long as I've been at PhotoBiz, and he is one of our agents here that is an SEO specialist. So if you've called in, you've probably had an opportunity to talk to Andy at some point and establish a relationship with him. He's an awesome asset to our team and always a pleasure to work with. So he's got a lot of great SEO information to share with you guys today. So. In addition to getting the opportunity to learn from Andy in today's webinar, we're also going to be ha having a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. So you can submit your questions using the chat tool inside of the GoToWebinar software, and they're going to be answered at the end of the presentation. Also, we do like to keep an ongoing conversation on Twitter, so we, can, we will be uh, tweeting live throughout this session using the hashtag PhotoBizLive. So, you guys can also jump on Twitter there, and we do encourage you to use that hashtag. Also, if you do have any questions, just message me directly using the chat tool, and we'll work on sorting out any kind of audio or visual concerns that you may have. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Andy. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone, as I know we do tend to have a worldwide audience for these. Uh, as Danny said, my name is Andy, and I am part of the passionate support team here at PhotoBiz. So, as the slide indicates, let's get started. Uh, what is SEO? As you may have heard Danny say, and as is displayed here on this slide, SEO is search engine optimization. It can also be a person. You can be a search engine optimizer, but today we're just going to be talking about search engine optimization which is what you index for and how you rank with the major search engines, Google, Yahoo, and Bing. We're going to cover getting started with your SEO, and then we're going to move into how to improve your SEO. So if the beginning is a little bit basic for you, please hang in there. We will be getting to the, to the items that are more useful a little bit later. Let's go. All right. When we talk about SEO, a lot of people wonder where we get our information from. Well, our primary source has always been Matt Cutts. Matt is the head of Google's web spam team, and he runs a blog. And while he doesn't give us everything about SEO, on his blog, he likes to keep people updated on the changes that Google makes and what Google is actually looking for. The, our other sources come from industry blogs. There is an entire search engine optimization industry out there. Uh, we've listed our favorite three, uh, SEO Moz, my personal favorite, SEO Book, and Search Engine Land. All of these are the websites for them. They all run blogs. They also offer other services. Like I say, we read these, we trust them, and because they back up their results. When they tell us things, they, they tell us how they came to this understanding. And finally, research. No one ever fully knows the Google algorithm unless they work for Google, so sometimes it really comes down to trial and error. We try and change something on the website, we wait two to three weeks, we see how Google accepts our change, and then we move on to the next thing. Uh, and this, like I say, this is a lot of what generates the industry blogs, is this trial and error effort. Okay, now a lot of people wonder, what actually counts for my SEO? Your SEO is the content of your web presence. Now this means your root domain name, uh, yourname.com, so for PhotoBiz, it's PhotoBiz.com. This also counts subdomains and subdirectories. In the past, there was a difference between these two with subdirectories being favored over subdomains. That has now changed as Google and Bing have consistently updated their algorithms. Now they work the same. So as you can see, two examples from PhotoBiz, blog.photobiz.com, this is the PhotoBiz corporate blog set up as a subdomain, or photobiz.com slash products. Now this is a link directly to our products page and that's a subdirectory. Both of those URLs are considered part of the PhotoBiz web domain. Your social media accounts, this is your Facebook, your Twitter, your LinkedIn, your Pinterest, your Google+. Now, we're referring to business pages on these. 
most people have a personal Facebook page, but this is not what we want to link to your website. It's great to have 3,000 friends. It's better to have a business page with 3,000 likes on it. Now, when you set up a business page, you set it up with your personal profile, so they're both necessary, but in terms of our business website, we only want to link to our business page. Uh, the same refers to Twitter. Uh, LinkedIn is a little bit of a gray area because it is, by its nature, a business social media site. Uh, Pinterest. Now, your account on Pinterest generally does not boost your SEO. Where Pinterest comes in is the sharing of your creations through people on Pinterest boards and the repinnings and the links that come from this. Google Plus is the same as Facebook. You have a personal and a business page. Uh, in fact, it really is Google's version of Facebook. Now, it did start out with a slow start, but it is becoming more prevalent, so it is worthwhile to have both a Facebook and a Google Plus profile. You may reach some of the same people, but generally, you're talking about two different sets of eyes. One thing that gets overlooked a lot is the power of the word of mouth. People trust the people that their friends have used in the past. So one of the greatest ways to improve your SEO is to let your clients do it for you. If you take a shot, you know, if we shoot, say, a portrait session, we want to make sure that on Facebook and on Twitter, we're tagging this person in our images, we're tweeting at this person. We are using this person's personal profile to expand our business's reach. Links to your website. Now, this has been one of the most contentious areas of SEO because there are good links and there are bad links. The way Google determines a good link compared to a bad link is that a good link is on a website with good content and good SEO. A bad link is a website that is only, the only purpose of this website is to boost someone's SEO. There's very little content, the links are hidden, uh, the text is not visible, basically it's a clearinghouse for links. So whenever someone offers to link to your website, take a minute, look at their website, and ask yourself, is this a website I want to associate myself with? Now we have a note here to avoid link directories. Now if you have access to professional directories, the PPA directory, um, your local directories, the APPI for our Australians. Those are good directories because they're professional directories. They're targeted at consumers looking for a specific industry. What we're talking about are link directories, again, with the specific purpose of improving your SEO. If someone offers to get you 5,000 clicks in two days, Odds are they're running a link directory, and you will see a boost in the short term. However, link directories are quickly penalized by Google, and this penalty applies to your website as well. Now, that doesn't mean if a random link shows up that you're automatically going to be penalized, but you want to make sure that when you're submitting your website to directories that they are legitimate directories targeting your audience. All right. Now on to the basics of getting started. The key point to remember is good SEO takes time. What we're talking about today is white hat organic SEO. White hat means that these are methods that are approved by Google for ranking. Organic SEO means that these are the search results that show up right below the paid advertisements. This is what used to be considered the best type of SEO, but that's changing as industries do. One thing to keep in mind is there is a difference between the ranking of your website and the indexing of your website. The indexing of your website refers to the search terms that you are found under. And this doesn't matter whether you're the number one or the number one thousandth. This is just saying that when someone searches for this specific phrase, your website shows up somewhere in the search. Your ranking is that difference between being the number one spot and the number 20 spot. And it's, all, it's much easier to be indexed for a search than to rank for a search. Okay, now this is a very popular question, metadata. You may have heard this referred to as your tags. Uh, some people just call it the title and the description. This is the back end of your website. This is telling search engines 
this is what my website is about. This is the content of my website. Don't try to trick Google in these areas. In the past, one of the, one of the favorite tricks was to include highly searched phrases like nude photography, um, cheat codes, things that people search for, but they're not actually related to your website. People setting up keywords in that nature are why keywords are no longer used for ranking. They are very, very easy to cheat. So we want to make sure that we're providing real and useful information about our website. Because the goal of Google is to provide the best search results, and that's what we're going for. We're trying to make sure that we give Google the best information we can. Now, of the three sections, you have your title, your description, and your keywords. Your title and your description are your marketing taglines. These are the two sections of your website that are going to entice a visitor to click on your link in that search result over someone else. So we want to make sure that they read well, that they're spelled correctly, and that they tell the person what they're going to see when they click on the link. All right, to focus on the title, your meta title is the blue text that shows up in the search result. I've used Photobiz here. You can see our search result. The blue text is our title. Now you'll see that we get our title clipped off by the three dots at the very end. Google gives you a limited amount of screen space. It used to be based on the number of characters. They have since changed that to the actual letters that you use. As you can see, letters like P, B, W, and T take up more space than an I or a lowercase t. Now, the more, the more capitals, the more large letters you use, the less is going to display. What we need to make sure is in our title is the business name, our location, and one or two of the keywords that we are trying to rank on. Now this is so that people know when you show up in a search result that this is the website that they are looking for. Your meta title is going to have the most effect on location-based search results. This is say Sacramento wedding photographer, Arizona landscape photographer. If you are trying to rank for a location make sure that location is in your website title. It is the best way to tell Google that this is what I am interested in ranking for. It doesn't necessarily have to show up in this very starting section here. If it gets cut off, that's fine. Google is still seeing it. Next, we move on to the meta description. The description, like the title, is based on the size of the letters that you're using. Generally, it's going to be 230 to 260 characters. So roughly two short sentences or one long sentence. Uh, again, I've highlighted photo business. You can see that we have condensed our, our description to make sure that the full description shows up. The display is going to be an inverted pyramid, as you can see here, where the first line is the longest line. If you do go on too long, you will get ellipsed off. So we always want to make sure that we lead with strength. If you want to focus on your wedding photography, then wedding photography needs to be the very first thing after an introduction of who you are and what you do. So we also want to make sure that we catch the searcher's attention. Just saying that you are a wedding photographer in Florida, it's not an inspiring description, but saying that you are an off-camera flash photojournalistic uh, wedding photographer with 13 years experience shooting in Florida is likely to catch someone's eye because you've specified your style, you've specified your area, and you've given them some assurances that you have done this before. This is also one of the really big reasons that we need to make sure that we are grammatically correct and that we've spelled everything correctly because we don't want to have mistakes showing up in these search results when we have generally two to three seconds to catch someone's attention. Now, if you don't get them on the first click, that's okay. Uh, search results have often shown that people click two to three times before finding what they're actually looking for, but you're still limited to seconds between the click to catch their attention. Keywords. Now, this is possibly the most, un the most misunderstood section of your metadata. Your keywords need to reflect what is on your website. They have 
absolutely no positive benefit on your ranking. They're only used for the indexing of your website. Google and Bing issue penalties for keyword stuffing. And when we talk about a penalty, this can involve lowering the rank of your website so you're seen in less search results. In extreme cases, it can result in an outright ban of your website. And a ban of your website means that no matter what term they use, they will not pull you up in a search result. We also want to emphasize what we want to rank on. If you provide a variety of services, we'll need to decide one at a time which services are our priority at this time and focus on those. We also want to include other services that we provide, but we want to emphasize what we're trying to rank well for. I also strongly recommend putting your personal name as well as any common misspellings of either your personal name or your business name. This is so that if someone meets you and they remember your name but not necessarily your website, you can still be found. Uh, this also applies for misspellings. If someone types in your name wrong, we most of us have seen the did you mean to search for that Google replies when we misspell something. We want to give Google that option by saying this is a common misspelling of my name. If someone types it in like this, they're probably looking for me. We're casting a wider net to account for people's inability to spell. The, as you can see in the screenshot, it's a very close up. In order to view the keywords on a website, you must actually access the page source. So what you type in this area is generally only read by SEOs like the SEO specialist here or someone looking to copy your website. Your general visitor will not know this section of your website even exists. All right, that kind of covers the basics of setting up the back end of your website. Let's move on to looking at your front end because this is what really matters. The content on your domain name. As we went over before, this covers anything that is based on your root domain name. Whether it's a subsite, whether it's your blog, whether it's folders in a hosting, these are all counted and content is king. That has been said by Google for years and years. What they are trying to provide is the most appropriate content for their searchers. So the more content we provide them, the better we're going to rank. Usability is counted in your rankings. We want to make sure that when someone visits your website, they can find what they're looking for quickly and easily. A good way to test this is to have a friend or family member who's never been to your website before visit your website and try to find something. Now you can specify something, say, I want you to act like you're interested in portrait photography, go to my website, find my portraits. If they can do it easily, that's great. If they're having difficulties, if you have to coach them, then we need to look at the organization of the website. Now this can be as simple as condensing things into a drop down menu or changing the names to be more reflective of what that page contains. It can be all the way to having to completely reconfigure the website. It but it's not something that we can ever know ourselves because we've set up these websites. The photo biz agents, we work with these every day. You've looked at your website so many times that you know it back and forth. This is where we need an outside perspective from it. Using captions, uh, photo biz provides the option to put captions on your images. These captions are crawled by Google. What you type there is read. So if you're worried about, say, your landscape photography and not people not knowing where the shot is taken, use your captions. Your visitors will see them. They'll know what you've shot. Google will see it. Google will say, I know what that picture is now because I've been told. Okay, looking to improve the SEO. Once we've set up our meta information and we've got our content, we need to look at improving our SEO. Now this can be done by adding content. And we're going to cover what counts as adding content, what counts as updating content. We're going to look at online marketing campaigns and how those can benefit you. We're going to look at link building. We talked about this previously, the good versus the bad. This is going to be how to do it. Guest posting. 
guest posting is a new buzzword in the SEO industry, and it refers to posting on someone else's blog. We're going to get into that and how to do it and the effective ways to do it. And finally, content marketing. As Google has said, content is king, but it doesn't always have to be on your website. So let's move on. Adding versus updating content. Updating content is making a change to your website without adding anything. This can be an update to your portfolio. This can be a change of the text on your website. You, if you update your pricing, if you update your hours, these, like I say, it, it's changing something without adding anything. Now, in terms of SEO, this an update doesn't necessarily boost or decrease your ranking. It can provide a boost for return traffic. If every six months you've updated your website and done a soft relaunch, say on Facebook and Twitter, announcing that you've got a new website, people that have already visited your website when they return are counted as visitors. The more visitors you have, the higher you rank. So updating your contents does not provide a direct boost to your SEO, but it can provide a boost from the returning visitors. Adding content is as it sounds. This is adding more information to your website, whether this is using a blog and making blog posts, or whether this is actually adding new pages to your website. Expanding your business, working in new markets, if you're willing to travel further now because you're a larger business, adding in a new page describing the new area that you're willing to work in. This is added content. And added content provides information for Google to crawl that is new, but has not replaced the old. So in terms of Google, we're seeing an expanding website. And generally, when websites expand, they're adding new useful content. Online marketing. Now, as I mentioned briefly earlier, organic search results are the results that show up right below the Google ad. You, anyone who's used Google has probably seen this kind of a peach background with a wet with a URL with this why this ad and ads related to PhotoBiz. As you can tell, I pulled this up by searching PhotoBiz.com. This is one of our Google AdWords campaigns. Now the AdWords are becoming more important. They're, Google is giving them more screen real estate. You may have noticed a change from one to three now. Uh, that seems to be the highest number they're willing to go at this point, but obviously that can change. So it may be worth investing some time and money in looking into a Google AdWords campaign. This is what is called pay-per-click advertising. You pay a small fee every time someone clicks on this link. However, you show up above the organic search results. You are the very first entry on that page. And research has shown that this is becoming a more common method of searching, is going through these ads. Now, Google provides a lot of products ahead of time before you ever sign any contracts with them to let you know how much this is going to cost. Because Google can provide an estimate based on previous experience of the likelihood of you being seen, as well as how much you're going to pay per click and what you can expect. The biggest advantages, obviously the increase in traffic by having more screen real estate on a search result and showing up at the top. These are also targeted ads. You can say that I want my ad to be shown for photo biz, for online proofing, and for flash websites. And when someone searches these, our ad will appear at the very top. You can also use other services that market your ads on other websites. Now, these are tailored to the person's search results. You may have seen this, or you may use a service like Adblock to prevent these ads from showing up. They tend to show up in the banners or at the sides, occasionally in the footers of other websites. Again, this is a very, this is an industry specific option to increase your SEO. It, it does take a bit of research to know if this is going to be worth your while because putting out a bunch of ads is wonderful if they get clicked on. If we're paying money for ads that are showing up on websites that are completely inappropriate, then we're not benefiting ourselves. So we're going to, this is more than we can cover today, but this is something that our SEO specialists are happy to go over with you if you have the time and the inclination.
Link building. Uh, I've used a screenshot here from uh, Bradley and Suzanne Feinberg's PowerVision website. Uh, it was a wonderful example of link building, and it also wonderfully features PhotoBiz at the very start. When we're looking for link building, what we want to look for is affiliated or related businesses. Obviously, an affiliated business is, say, the catering service that you run out of the same building that you run your photography studio out of. If you have multiple businesses, it never hurts to link them together. Related businesses are services that your visitors would find useful that you don't necessarily offer. I'm going to use weddings as an example because there's a lot that goes into setting up a wedding. So for a wedding photographer, you may want to link to a caterer, to a florist, to a wedding officiant, to wedding chapels, to limousines, to DJs, to event planners. All of these are services that the bride and groom will need, but you don't provide them. So what we're offering here is an, a website that caters to multiple needs of the searcher, and this is a great benefit. Now the crucial thing to keep in mind is that linking out to websites provides use for your visitors, but the real boost comes in having those websites link back to you. So you want to make sure that you've contacted these people. It's wonderful to link to a florist, but we want to make sure that that florist, one, knows that you're linking to them, and two, links back to you. And this shows a parity between the businesses. They, there is at least been some sort of contact. The businesses are aware of each other. Our second point here is legitimate businesses, obviously. If you wouldn't trust this business, if you wouldn't give them your money, then don't ask your visitors to. We want to make sure that everybody is legitimate here. Again, we go to link clearinghouses. There are plenty of websites out there that will offer you links all over the place, but these are not legitimate links. And while they may work in the short term, these are not long-term solutions. We also want to make sure that we're not abusing this. Uh, creating links everywhere to anything imaginable seems like it would be a wonderful idea. And it was for a while until Google realized that's what was happening. So we want to make sure, again, that we're linking to things that people will actually need and use. Guest posting. Okay, this is a relatively new idea that has been spawned by Google's attempt to increase authorship. And what Google means by authorship is knowing who has written what online. Uh, if you search for a, a trending topic or a news item, you may see a small thumbnail of the author showing up next to their link. And this is what Google is talking about when they're applying authorship to things. So the benefits of guest posting is you're, you're increasing your visibility. So obviously we want to look at blogs that already have a lot of traffic. Ideally, we want it to be a blog that has formed somewhat of a community around itself. Um, you may see this on, say, seomoz.org, as they have a blog section, which is run by their company, and they have a umoz section, where anyone who has joined their community can submit an article. So these are the kind of sites we're looking for, whether it's aerial photographers discussing their planes, uh, to just discussing what your favorite lens is on a blog. We want to have, we want to look for blogs that have an engaged community, you know, lots of comments on the blogs, lots of interaction. This, the benefits of posting this blog are generally, it's going to provide a link back to your own website. If you've written something really great, it can be shared through other blogs. Again, increasing the number of links into your website. We've also said that you are an authority on your subject. If you, if a very popular lens blog allows you to post as a guest, you are demonstrating that you know what you're talking about. I've included uh, a screen capture here of Sal Sincata's recent blog with us, Making Money with an Online Sales Strategy. PhotoBiz provides the opportunity to guest blog. Uh, so you, by posting on our blog, Sal has in created links to his website and increased his visibility through photo business clientele who may or may not have been aware of Sal himself before now. When we're trying to post a guest blog, we want to we want to message the moderators. The editor of the blog, it it may be just a single owner, it may be an editor who manages several authors. And we want to show engagement. We don't 
just sending an email that says, I want a guest post, just give me a link and I'll be happy, is going to be ignored. Commenting on their blog, establishing that relationship, and letting them know that you can provide useful content for their blog is much more likely to get you a spot. Also, don't be too persistent. If you're not getting responses from a website, they may not be interested. And even if they are interested, continuing to contact them can leave a sour taste. So we want to we want to have a nice give and take with other blogs because we're asking for space on their website. Content marketing. This is again one of the newer ideas coming out of the SEO industry. It may be useful to you. It may just be something that you have to look at and say, I don't have the time or the the ability to do this. Content marketing is providing, again, as always, useful information, except this time we're presenting it in a format that can be shared throughout the internet. Whether this is a viral video, uh, you may have seen the $1 Shave Club video. Uh, if you've never heard of this, it's worth searching to see. Uh, it, just type in $1, uh, $1 shaving and you will see a video about this shave club. And the video went viral and has now become a big thing on the internet. This might be an infographic. You may have seen these before. It covers a topic with a nice with bar graphs and numbers and we provide information in an easy to digest format. These are wonderful because they can be shared through social media sites Facebook, Twitter, or beyond that to aggregate sites like Reddit or Dig or StumbleUpon. And these can, being shared through aggregate sites and social media can help what is called going viral. It could even be something like a flash game that provides educational material. Uh, off the top of my head, I would say as a photographer, if you so chose, you could design a flash game in based around selecting the right lens for a shot. Now, is it, going, is it guaranteed to go viral? No, nothing is ever guaranteed when we're talking about the internet. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, going viral refers to any piece of content on the internet becoming widely shared, generally through social media. Uh, the going viral refers to the way it's passed from person to person to person. Uh, we, wanna, we always want to push this kind of content marketing through multiple outlets. As I said, social media is a great way to start. Uh, publish it on your Facebook page, have your friends share it, tweet it. Uh, if there is an industry expert that you think would find this interesting, tweet at them. Oftentimes when things go viral, it's because either celebrities or influential internet personalities have taken a like to the content and have shared it to their followers. You can always check how many followers someone has on Twitter by going to their profile. And anytime you tweet at them, you have a chance of being seen by those viewers. Obviously, the, the ultimate goal is to have that personality retweet your content or share it on their Facebook page. But even a small following of a few hundred people can increase your search engine ranking. Now, the one thing to remember with content marketing is it's a one-time pop. If you go viral in May, but you don't do anything to follow up in June or July, by August, your results will have returned back down to their original spot. This is a wonderful way to get that quick boost, but it's not sustainable unless you're pumping out content month after month after month. So this is often a great way to highlight a campaign or to break into a new area because it gets your face up there and ideally the increased traffic from this content will keep your ranking up there, but you do have to keep it up. Well, that is the presentation for today. We are now on to our questions and answers, and I will I will be handing it over to Danny in just a moment, and we will get started. All right, I hope you guys got a lot of information out of that presentation, and I certainly did. And I'm sure you guys have a ton of great questions, so we're going to go ahead and pull the, the questions up, and we're going to see what you guys have for us.
All right, so we do have a lot of questions that are very similar to each other. And again, if you guys do have any questions that are more catered to your personal account, just feel free to give the support team a call here and ask to speak to one of our SEO specialists. That way we can help you directly. So if it is a question uh, directly pertaining to your account, we do ask for you to call our support team. So we did get a question here that came in and it is asking what is keyword stuffing and we also have a question can you please go over good links and bad links again so I'm gonna let Andy answer those two questions and then we'll move on to your other questions okay keyword stuffing this is using repetitive instances of the same keyword with slight modifications Generally, we see this when you are actively trying to stuff your keywords. This is using, say, photography, photographer, photographers, photo, photographs, tagged in with another word. Say, wedding photographer, wedding photographs, wedding photography, wedding photographers, repetitiously over and over again, generally in multiple sections of the website. That is where with a PhotoBiz account we generally see this problem coming in because we offer a global and a page specific and when we see people using the exact same phrase in every section of the website we are looking at keyword stuffing. Now a good link versus a bad link is based on what Google thinks of the linking site. If it's a website designed specifically to boost other people's search engine optimization, that's a bad link. If it's a website that features a lot of spam content or viruses, that's a bad link. Good links are legitimate websites, um, PhotoBiz, Lowe's Foods, Whole Foods, any legitimate business's website that links to you in an open manner, saying, I trust this photographer, I link to them. If you're interested in buying flowers for your wedding, I recommend this florist. These are what we call good links. All right, so we have another question here from Suzanne. So um, this is actually a pretty common question that we get a lot, whether we're at it shows or just something people hear and they're not really too sure about it. And uh, this question comes from Suzanne, and Suzanne's asking, I am told that Flash websites such as PhotoBiz templates are not seen by the Google crawlers. Um, uh, how can I uh, best try to accomplish SEO for our website with PhotoBiz? And I'm going to let Andy answer that question just a little bit more about Flash and uh, indexing in general. Okay, this is a bit of information that used to be true. In past years, Flash did not index as well as HTML. That was true up until February of 2011 when Matt Cutts announced that Google had updated their algorithm to crawl Flash websites, or as they refer to it, .swf websites, the same way that they crawl HTML websites. You may notice that in your PhotoBiz search engine section you have the option to choose which you index, your Flash or your HTML, if you have both. We provided this option in the past because Flash did perform worse than HTML. That's no longer the case. At this point, your search engine indexing only determines what Google considers to be your primary website. If you index your Flash website, that will be the result that Google attempts to go to first. If you index your HTML site, you may, this is not always the case, but you may end up with a direct link to your HTML site, avoiding your Flash website.
All right, and we have another great question from Steve, and Steve's say, uh, asking, each page on my website has an SEO section. Can you, get, can you go over what that will do if used? So I'm going to hand that over to Andy. Okay, you may have heard me refer to global SEO versus page-specific SEO in the answer to one of the other questions. What this means is that the global section is what's under your search engine tab, your page-specific SEO, the SEO sections on each page. These work in the exact same manner as your global SEO, except they're focused entirely on what is on that web page. Since Google cannot read images, this is a great way to tell Google what is in your galleries. If you've shot at famous locations, if you've been featured by national or international magazines, or on other companies' websites. You can include this in the description and the keywords on each individual page, and this will allow Google to have a more rounded view of your website. All right, we're getting so many great questions here. We're working through, sorting through all of them. So keep them coming, and we do appreciate you taking your time to type in your questions and joining us in today's session. So let's go ahead and grab a new question here. Oh, in the meantime, as we go through these questions, uh, I did see somebody who asked if the PowerPoint slides will be available. Um, yes, we'll make them available for download as well, so you will be able to review that. Also, the video will be on our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash photobiz, so you can view the video there as well, especially that will help out if you joined us late today. All right, and uh, here's a great comment uh, and question from Anthony. There was an article on Forbes.com on 720 titled, The Death of SEO, The Rise of Social, PR, and Real Content. Uh, what are your thoughts on SEO going by the wayside? And uh, I think we both can touch on that. I'm going to let Andy go ahead and answer first. Okay, the Forbes article is correct. The most recent major update to Google was called the Panda Update and it featured an over-optimization penalty. Uh, what, what Google had noticed is that as the search engine industry became larger, that more people were trying different ways of increasing their site's ranking without improving its content. So Google has updated their algorithm to look for these kind of things. Now, does that mean that SEO in and of itself is completely dead? I would disagree, because SEO does count the social PR. This is what search engine optimization isn't just your meta tags. It's the content marketing. It's your ads. It's, it can even encompass your radio ads and how well those are converting to visits to your website as opposed to in-person or phone calls. So the SEO industry is an adaptive industry. Obviously, we have to change with Google. 
they never tell us our algorithm, but they do update it, and we do have to adapt to those changes. And this is just another change that the SEO industry will adapt to, because it's always going to be prevalent where you show up in a search result. So really, Forbes is talking about the semantics of someone who looks at entirely the back end of your website, and that's what they consider your SEO, compared to the more common industry term, which encompasses most of the marketing that you do with your business. And that's a, that's a great answer from Andy. And just touching on that, you know, um, as it is changing from the more traditional back end, your keywords, how you're defining them, make sure you're getting everything, you know, all your T's crossed and your I's dotted there, that, that makes sense. But it's also bringing in account of your whole entire marketing platform, like Andy said. So your social media bringing in traffic, any word of mouth bringing in traffic, just kind of as your online reputation grows, that's also pay, uh, playing in a part uh, in your SEO as well. So let's see if we can grab another question here before we wrap things up. Uh, another question here, real quick, came from Whitney. Will indexing matter if I'm concerned about iPad and iPhone users trying to view my site? And uh, so for anyone that doesn't understand that question, that's referring, will it matter what I choose index in the back end of my control panel if I want mobile users to access my site? I'm actually really glad somebody asked this because this is one of my favorite features of your PhotoBiz website. It's what we call our automatic redirect. And what PhotoBiz is set up is a script that runs when someone visits your website and it runs through a set of checklists. The first thing it looks for is the Flash Player. If it has the Flash Player, then they get to see your Flash website. If the Flash Player is not present, then it checks to see whether it's a tablet or a phone. If it's a tablet, your iPad, your Galaxy tablets, then they get your HTML website. If it's a phone, they go to our mobile template. Now, all of this is done in the background. You don't have to set any of it up. Google doesn't have to know about this because as far as Google is concerned, if someone goes to your domain name, they will always see a viable website as long as you have our HTML and mobile mirrors. That was a great answer from Andy, and just to mention for you guys, so if you don't have the HTML mirror, it's definitely a great addition to add on to your website, and it's going to allow your website to be seen on any device, so definitely keep that in mind, and if you have any more questions about that, you can give us a call and talk to one of our support team members, and they'll fill you in some more information about having that mirror available on your website so you're fully accessible by anybody from any device. So we're going to see if we can grab a final question, and then we'll wrap things up here. So thank you guys so much for your patience, and let me grab our last question. All right, so this is our final question, came in from Adam, and I see that you've asked two questions here, Adam, so we're going to touch on uh, both of those. If I put keyword photography in SEO, will other keywords such as photographer or photographers automatically be included by Google, or 
should I put similar words in the SEO without stuffing? And I will let Andy answer this final question for everybody. Okay, and for everyone else who can't see Adam's question, his follow-up was about if he uses the keyword phrase photographers in Regina, if someone searching for photography in Regina would see his results. And the answer to both of these questions is yes. The Google algorithm is roughly as smart as a person when it comes to taking in keywords, especially in English. Other languages they're still working out on, and we've seen examples of that recently with uh, Dutch specifically, but in English, the term photography, photographer, photographers, they're all considered the same term. Now, does this mean that you must use one? Certainly not. I've seen plenty of websites that use the duplication, the photography, photographer, photographers, and they're not being penalized. The, there is no, this is the line for stuffing. Generally, what I recommend is copy what you have put in your keyword sections. Paste it into Microsoft Word, into TextEdit on your Mac, some way that you can view it outside of the small box on your website, and look at it. Just act, physically look at the section. If your eyes can pick up the same word again and again and again, so much so that it's very obvious, then we need to look at if you're stuffing. Generally, keyword stuffing takes effort and is something that's intentionally done, rather than being an accidental occurrence. Now, Google's Webmaster Tools is a wonderful setup for this because it will tell you if you're being penalized for any reason. It will also show you the import of the words on your website. And if Webmaster Tools says that photography is your most prominent keyword and it's what it's focused on, and photographer shows up at the very bottom of your list, then you know you can remove photographers. But if they're both showing up very highly, then we need to leave them there. And again, I'm very sorry there's not a, you must use it 15 or less times, because there is no hard and fast on this. The bigger, bigger websites will obviously use the keywords again and again. If you're a photographer and you provide eight different kinds of photography services, you are going to use those words more than someone who offers two. And this is why there's no hard and fast area, because everyone's website is distinct. All right, well, that concludes our uh, webinar today. So thank you so much, everybody, for all the great questions. And a big thank you again to Andy for taking the time to create this presentation for everybody. And a recording of today's webinar is going to be posted on the PhotoBiz YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash PhotoBiz. We're going to do our best to have that online nice and quick for you guys. Also, be sure to check out our blog and watch out for our next email, which is going to be including the September webinar speakers and series as well. So thank you again for joining us, and this concludes our episode of PhotoBiz Live. Also, just wanted to touch base. If you guys have any kind of questions, we always encourage you to please take advantage of your membership as a PhotoBiz client, and that's your access to the support team. So just give the support team a call here toll-free at 866-463-7620. 20 anytime Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you want to talk specifically about search engine optimization, just ask to speak with one of our SEO specialists, and they'll be more than glad to help you out. Thank you again, and everybody, we hope you have a great day.